Next on Eyewitness News at 11, numbers released by the State Comptroller's Office sent mixed messages. We'll bring you the details. Eyewitness News at 11 starts in 60 seconds. Now, your forecast first. Hey, good evening, T.I. Meteorologist Craig Flint. So uh, as we go through the rest of the overnight out there, not much going on. Clouds are going to increase. There could be another shower. Clear sky now, though, at Griffith, 72. Uh, and the dew points are in the 60s, mid-60s. So that's probably where we're going to land tonight in terms of the low temperature. With some increasing clouds, maybe a brief shower. Uh, low temperature by the time you wake up right around 65. Complete forecast coming up. Eyewitness News at 11 starts right now. This is Eyewitness News at 11 on WUTR. Tonight's top stories at 11. A special meeting of the Utica Common Council tonight concluded yet again without a clear plan for complete streets. We'll tell you when you can expect answers from the city. And wildfire smoke is back in the conversation this week. Forest rangers with the state's Department of Environmental Conservation just returned home after spending two weeks battling those flames. We'll hear what they had to say later. Plus. Mayor Paul Mary announcing big changes coming to Franklin Square Alley in downtown Utica will bring you the details. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for Eyewitness News at 11. I'm Shelby Pay. The question of whether or not Genesee Street in Utica would be two lanes or four from Oriskany Street South to Court Street was expected to be resolved this afternoon at a special meeting of the Utica Common Council. The answer to the question? Well, you'll have to wait until Wednesday. Ordinance 9 was put before the council this afternoon. That ordinance would have returned the flow of traffic for those five blocks of Genesee Street to two northbound and two southbound lanes, as they had been for decades. But instead of a vote, the council tabled the motion and put it back into committee. It is expected to be back on the floor for a vote at the next council session on Wednesday. But the vote has to be a simple majority. So will there be a resolution? Well, we'll have to wait and see. A record 24 million acres in Canada have been destroyed due to the ongoing wildfires. Our capital correspondent, Emil Taligi, tells us what forest rangers have been doing to help during these unpredictable times. Pretty much that was the gist of our two-week assignment, was uh, seek and destroy hotspots. And uh, we did it really well. Uh, I think we uh, showed, showed Quebec what we can do. They, uh, yeah, I think they... Uh, Appreciate everything we did. Gary Miller was in charge of a 20 person crew while in Canada. He says normally firefighters dig lines to help control fires. These are trenches that deprive the wildfire of additional fuel by removing surrounding debris. But Miller says this wasn't possible in Canada. In Quebec, because the fire was so big and uh, hand line and dozer line is, you just can't do it with the uh, terrain. Um, it's pretty much. Uh, they let the fire go until it hits a uh, wet area and then they use their helicopters to control it that way. He says there were around eight helicopters being used in Canada and they did a great job executing precision drops with Bambi buckets. As far as when we'll see an end to all this, that's to be determined. Just not feasible. To, I couldn't tell you how many people you'd have to put on it and uh, I just, the risk is not, not worth it. We often put it in terms of, you know, the thinking, breathing thing that uh, has a mind of its own fire. John D'Alessandro, Association Secretary for FASNI, says it's hard to predict where these wildfires will travel and how long they'll last. You know, firefighters uh, believe that they have a large wildland fire under control, but then the wind shifts, okay? 
Um, and it goes into a whole new area that might have a lot of combustible material available to it. Those wildfires impacting New York State. The governor announced an air quality health advisory for today, which can be monitored through airnow.gov. Reporting in Albany, Amel Talegi. And in some exciting news, earlier today, Utica Mayor Robert Palmieri and First Ward Councilperson Katie Aiello unveiled plans to beautify and activate the alley at Franklin Square. The project is part of the Utica Prosperity Initiative and is where Councilperson Aiello directed her district's allocation of American Rescue Plan Act money. The alley will take on a theme of the Erie Canal, which is a big part of Utica's history and its downtown. The project features the already completed restoration of the walls that frame the alley. Also included in the project are ribbon style benches, an Erie Canal motif laid out in Ruby Lake glass along the alley floor, and other decorative elements. The city says that Franklin Square Alley has been the location of public art and programming in recent years, and this redesign will enhance residents' ability to continue those traditions. Construction will start later in the summer and should be finished by the fall. Be sure to get our CNY homepage app to stay up to date on all the latest local news. Before we go to break, here's a preview of your weather with Chief Meteorologist Craig Flint. Hey Shelby, good evening to you. So still a warm and humid weather around. Also some smoke, air quality issues. When the smoke leaves, when the humidity drops in my forecast next. Your eyewitness weather hey, forecast. Hey, good evening. I'm meteorologist Craig Flint. Let's talk some weather as we get you up to date with the forecast. It's still warm and humid, but the humidity is going to slowly be dropping. Uh, not so much tomorrow, but by the time we get into Wednesday, I think so. 72 now at the top of the hour at Griffiths and Rome. The dew point 66. Uh, so that's still uncomfortable. Uh, I think we're going to land in the mid 60s tonight. There could be a brief thunder shower. Tomorrow, warm and humid. There could be a few widely scattered downpours, maybe a gusty storm in the afternoon. Uh, high temperature around 82. Here's a look at what's going on uh, with live Doppler radar right now. And uh, there's one lone cell that just moved up the west end of um, Oneida Lake. And then a few more light sprinkles and showers here 
central Oneida County, larger area of rain to the south and west that we'll watch. I think this is very light. It's probably just a few sprinkles, really. Uh, numbers now are in the low 70s at Utica to Ilion, down the 90 towards Herkimer. Little Falls is at 70. 68 right now in Norway. Dalgeville, 69. Waterville, 70. 70 right now, Hartwick over to Milford. Low 70s in Morris and Cooperstown, upper 60s, Sherburn, and low and mid 60s uh, into the Adirondacks. So, again, that little gaggle of showers to the south and west. We'll watch that kind of uh, swipe uh, off to the north and east here. So, these are going to kind of move uh, in this direction. So, they just might clip through uh, the immediate Mohawk Valley. This is the smoke. Uh, vertically integrated smoke, so basically the smoke that's in the sky right now. All of these brighter reds and oranges indicate some thicker smoke, but look to the north and west. Up over here, Green Bay, Alpena, Lower Michigan, uh, it really thins out. So I think with time, we're going to see the smoke thin out. We do have air quality alerts. These are now extended through Tuesday because we're still going to have some of the smoke around. But watch as we click the hours away. We get into the afternoon, 2, 3, 4, 5. Notice again, the colors become a little more faint, a little lighter. So we'll see the smoke tend to ease a little bit. So the air quality should improve a bit, especially by later tomorrow. Tonight, passing shower while you sleep, no biggie. Tomorrow, warm and humid, another passing shower, thunderstorm in the afternoon. You can see those right there on Futurecast. Could be a few lingering into tomorrow night. And then by the time we get to Wednesday, look at that, the sky opens up, we clear out. By Wednesday, uh, we'll get rid of the smoke, so we'll have a blue sky and sunshine. Also, the humidity will be down. Temperature right around 80. That is spot on. That's right where we should be uh, for this time of year. So a storm tomorrow afternoon, clears out, smoke leaves, becomes less humid by Wednesday, 80. Thursday, becoming warm and humid again. Best chance of showers and storms late in the day. There will be on and off showers and thunderstorms Friday. Not as warm, 77, sphere to 76 on Saturday. And I think Saturday is mainly dry. There could be an isolated shower or thunderstorm. Then we get into the second half of the weekend. I think by then uh, we will see some nicer weather, but also some warmer weather returning Sunday up near 80. And then I think more humidity by the time we get to early next week with highs in the mid 80s. So all in all, not too bad. We've got to take a quick break. Stay right there. More eyewitness news coming up after this.
You're watching Eyewitness News at 11 on WUTR. Welcome back to Eyewitness News at 11. The New York State Board of Regents voting to update its regulations when it comes to definitions relating to corporal punishment. Capital correspondent Jamie DeLine has that story. Corporal punishment is not legal in New York schools, which is when physical force is used on a student for discipline. On Monday, the New York Board of Regents voted to further update its regulations, making it clear what constitutes corporal punishment and what doesn't. For example, if a teacher was trying to protect a, himself or herself uh, from a student who's lunging at the teacher um, or a student lunging at another student, um, any type of restraint that would be involved in that interaction would not constitute corporal punishment because you'd be protecting another human being. In the past, a student could be restrained if they were causing damage to physical property. If we had someone who knocked over a filing cabinet or knocked over a desk, if, if a child had done that, then the, the staff or the faculty if properly trained, were technically able to restrain that child. Um, and now that's been taken away. The New York State Education Department released a statement saying in part, quote, the department's updated regulations continue to prohibit the use of corporal punishment and aversive interventions inconsistent with federal guidance at a prohibition on the use of seclusion. It, it really basically, you know, follows a whole bunch of studies that indicate that when you put uh, kids in secluded rooms, you lock the door, you, you know, you, you place them in a position where you are, you know, really engaging in a whole bunch of potential emotional harm. Um, and the state is indicating that that's just not in any way, shape or form pedagogically appropriate. The New York State Education Department says the changes were based on reports of corporal punishment from school districts, state and federal guidance and local and national reporting on trauma experienced by students. Leslie Silva, a partner at Tully Rinky, says the definition of corporal punishment was vague and these new regulations will close legal loopholes. Schools are going to have to tell the Department of Education, you know, what's been going on, what they've been doing, if they've had to use any restraint or seclusion. Uh, and that's really important because we didn't have that data collection before. Reporting in Albany, I'm Jamie DeLine. Numbers released today by the Office of State Comptroller Thomas DiNapoli sent mixed messages regarding the state's economy. DiNapoli reports that the state took in $27.6 billion in tax revenue in the first quarter of the fiscal year. That was almost $451 million more than what was projected, but it was also $7 billion less than the same time last fiscal year. DiNapoli noted that a slowing of consumer spending and volatility on Wall Street had an impact on personal income tax collection. The state is projecting multi-billion dollar gaps in the coming years and has a $19 billion contingency fund to help ease that pain. And a two-car accident on Route 365 in the town of Vernon shut down 365 for most of the morning today. The Oneida County Sheriff's Office reports that a car northbound on Route 365 crossed into the opposite lane and hit a pickup truck. The crash occurred a little after 8.30 this morning near the intersection of 365 and 9th Street. The driver of the car, 27-year-old Dakota Little of Oneida, was pronounced deceased at the scene. The driver of the pickup and a nine-year-old passenger in the truck suffered minor injuries. The Oneida County Sheriff's Office is handling that investigation. And unfortunately, a bobcat has tested positive for rabies in Otsego County. That county's Department of Health reports that the positive test came back on Saturday. The bobcat apparently came into contact with a dog, but that dog is vaccinated against rabies. Four people are undergoing post-exposure treatments one of those people having actually had contact with the bobcat. The incident took place in the town of Unadilla. Just ahead tonight, sports director Brennan Miller tells us about the Comet's season ticket member party that happened this evening. Stay with us.
<laughs> so I ran back and looked, and I was like, oh, yeah, I did, and then came back in here. What's up? Yeah, sure. Check. One, two, three. Good evening. Brennan Miller here, and I've got sports via WUTR. I don't know. Wiffle ball I'd be down for. Pickleball? Yeah, we could do that. We could definitely do that. Really? I'm sure. That's not a bad idea. I'll get some chalk. We can play four square. <laughs> Eyewitness Sports right now. Good evening, I'm Brennan Miller with Eyewitness Sports. Today a big day for the Utica Comets off of the Adirondack Bank Center ice. A pair of community-minded events taking place revolving around the team and specifically the fans. Today is the day of the Comets season ticket member summer party at the Utica University Nexus Center featuring food and drinks, raffles, a silent auction, and free public skate and skate rentals. This was an opportunity for Comet season ticket members to get back to the odd as the season rapidly approaches. For some eligible fans, there was also a chance to win their seat for free. That is, of course, if they could make a ice length shot into a two by four hole, which I did see that some did. The party lasted from 5 to 7.30, but all of that was preceded by another big Comets event, Joe Gambardella and Ryan Schmelzer's Comets Kids Camp. The Comets captains running the camp at the Nexus Center today through Thursday, offering players at the Might, Squirt, Pee Wee, and Bantam levels up to nine hours of total ice time and personal coaching from the two players over the next three days. Along with the on-ice training, players at the camp will also have four off-ice training sessions, getting in shape for their upcoming junior hockey seasons, and will also receive a camp jersey and t-shirt. Registration for it is still open, and the link to sign up for the remaining three days is at uticacomets.com slash camp. Along with hockey, there was also some basketball going on tonight, as it does every Monday night. The Utica Lady Knicks Premier League back in action. The early game this week, the Earl Savory Bairdians in green and the team represented by Seasonal Sports in blue. Early on, the game nodded at 17, a great ball movement, and Brooke Hammersley hits the three. The Bairdians take the lead. Seasonal's Ella Trink is going to hit their next shot, though. Fakes the deep three and instead comes inside here for the floater for two. There's the fake, and she goes in. But Bairdians just too consistent, though. All the way around the arc, the ball's going to move here. It goes to Kayla Campbell in the corner, and she hits the three with the open look. And then in the next quarter, does it again. She finished with a game-high 22 points as the Bairdians move to 3-3. Three and three. The victory here, 69-57. to 57. The other games tonight. First off, a low-scoring affair between Snyder Landscaping and Notre Dame School. Snyder moves to 3-3 three three with a win, a 9-point victory, with Savannah Summer leading the way for the winners with 10 points. Morgan Brewer on the other side had 20 of 34 total for Notre Dame. Then a close contest in the third game. Gates Cole squeaks past Cohen and Cohen, 57-54. to 54. Alana Batson, the leading scorer, with 15, and Molly Coyne followed her with 11. And the final game, the big one between the unbeaten squads, Nina's Pizza and Brian Gaetano Company. The showdown of the night, both trying to move to 6-0, but it's the reigning defending champions. Nina's turns it on under the bright lights, 76 52 victory, three players in double figures. Kylie Snow leads the way with 16, but CeCe Lapartosa and Mackenzie Hess both followed closely behind with 14 apiece. And we close our sports segment tonight with sad news out of the city of Rome. Former RFA Academy football coach Tom Hoke has passed away today. Hoke built one of the most dominant football programs in New York State in his 27 years with the Black Knights. His record, 
210 wins, only 41 losses, and four ties. Good for a win percentage of 824, the second highest ever among Section 3 coaches, and included a 39-game unbeaten streak. Most of those games played before the formal state championship was set up, but in his time on the sideline, his teams won 19 league titles, eight sectional championships, a pair of regional crowns, and in 1981, his Black Knight team was voted as state champion by the New York State Sports Writers Association. He was also voted as New York State Coach of the Year in that 81 season and was inducted to the Greater Utica Sports Hall of Fame in 2015. His battles against the other Central Oneida League powerhouses made for many an exciting Friday night on the field that was renamed in his honor. For now, that's all for sports. Check out seemyhomepage.com for your top sports stories. More Eyewitness News coming up right after the break. Eyewitness News continues on WUTR. When the great New York State Fair opens to the public in 37 days, it will offer an opportunity for you and your family to go back in time, all the way to the Mesozoic era when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Immersive Productions is bringing its widely popular dinosaur expedition and interactive educational experience to the New York State Fair for all 13 days. Best of all, access will be included in the price of fair admission. More than 60 true-to-life size prehistoric lifelike dinosaurs will roar into the Exposition Center starting August 23rd. The must-see exhibit features dinosaurs that range in size from babies measuring three feet or fun size tall to full-grown massive creatures that stand as tall as 35 feet and span as long as 80 feet. Visitors will be able to walk through the indoor experience at their own pace taking in the wonders of dinosaurs, including the Tyrannosaurus rex, Velociraptor, Brachiosaurus, and Stegosaurus. Several displays, including an opportunity to climb into a dinosaur egg and a dinosaur's mouth, serve as prime selfie destinations, satisfying fairgoers who have a social media flair. Visitors of all ages will also be encouraged to interact and dance along to an animatronic dinosaur van and show off their skills in daily dinosaur dance parties held every other hour. Admission tickets and parking for the 2023 Great New York State Fair will go on sale soon, and the purchasing information, as soon as it's available, will be provided at the fair's website and on its social media platforms. And we'll close out the broadcast when we return.
Eyewitness News continues on WUTR. All righty, welcome back. Let's get you up to date with the forecast so you know before you go on Tuesday. Another warm and humid day. Uh, temperatures will uh, end up in the low 80s with a shower or thunderstorm somewhere in the afternoon. Uh, the humidity will drop. By the way, the smoke will clear out too by late Tuesday into Wednesday. Fresher air, a high near 80 with a good deal of sunshine. Does get warm and more humid again Thursday with some late day showers and thunderstorms. Not quite as warm. Heading into Friday and Saturday, there will be on and off rain showers and thunderstorms around through the day. Friday 77, it becomes more spotty on Saturday. Highs into the mid 70s and all in all, I think the weekend's okay. By Sunday, partly to mostly sunny, warmer, high temperature uh, near 80 degrees. And it does look like the humidity will return somewhat as we go into early next week as temperatures balloon into the mid 80s by the time we get from, uh, or two rather, one week from today. That is the check of the forecast. Shelby, over to you. All right, thanks, Craig, and thank you for staying up with us tonight. As Craig said earlier, we're still working out some kinks here, but we appreciate you bearing with us tonight. It'll all be worth it when we're in that new studio. Have a great night. We'll see you back here again tomorrow.